Hey, it's a guys. Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom Fanatics brought to you by the Freedom Advocacy Network. Today we've got a little bit of an economics focus as we look forward to the national budget speech, which is being given on Wednesday. Alongside me, we have Sholem Boyson from the Freedom Advocacy Network, as well as Becky Mashlobo, who is joining us uh, from the Center for Risk Analysis. He is no stranger to Freedom Fanatics. And it's all, you, you know something's going down in the economics world when we bring Becky on to, to share some <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> Yeah. So, Becky, <laughs> let's let's jump straight into it. Um, so, the national budget speech is on Wednesday tomorrow. Um, yeah. First of all, what is it? What is the national budget speech? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alex. So, the budget speech essentially is an update by the South African government, National Treasury, on the fiscus of the country in terms of government revenues in form of taxation government expenditure, uh, where government uses that taxation to uh, spend on. Now, when it is commonly referred to as government revenue, this is actually taxation collected from South African citizens. And unfortunately, over the past decade, from a policy perspective, the South African uh, government has been implementing policies that has resulted in large government expenditure by way of increase in uh, a social wage bill, uh, bailouts of SOEs, uh, that has resulted in increase in uh, the deficit as well as now of government debt levels. So in terms of this budget speech, a uh, close eye will be kept on if we'll see an increase in, in taxation items, such as that of syntax, as well as individual taxes, for example, or, co or company tax and fuel levies. Okay, cool. So, Becky, I saw a, a stat earlier this week that uh, per, of personal income tax. Uh, so 7 million South Africans pay 40% of tax revenue that's collected by the government. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, we know that there's a bit of a jobs crisis in the country. Um, what, what kind of measures could the, could, uh, you know, God, the Minister of Finance take to try and expand the tax base to get more people in employment, to get more revenue from taxpayers? I know ta increased tax revenue was one of the positive things uh, that came about uh, in the last year, in the last financial mm -hmm. year. Um, what kind of thing, can we hear anything to, is this the occasion where we hear plans to try and improve our tax base, to try and get more people into jobs? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, that might not be the case there, Alex. Uh, in terms of, you know, going and trying to raise revenue, uh, he might try to do that by increasing sin tax or some are suggesting that he might increase fuel levy taxes or other any other forms of taxation. Uh, what Enoch Wanagwana should do, in fact, is should, it should highlight um, the negative consequences of a low growth economy from policy perspective, like you mentioned that of the tax base shrinking. In fact, if you were to look at 2019 third quarter numbers of the number of people employed compared to our latest numbers, we still short about 2 million South Africans that are without employment. And that also negatively impact the fiscus in terms of uh, individual taxation and so forth. So what Enoch Bonagwana should do, if you would like to increase government revenue while at the same time decreasing government expenditure, it should highlight the fact that SOEs should stop receiving bailouts, should highlight the ballooning civil service wage bill, should highlight the uh, consequences of hostile policies, such as what we're seeing with the labor market, for example, where we don't have enough South Africans employed to raise government revenues. And you also mentioned there, uh, Alex, of the increase in government revenue expense and in government revenue. Um, that was largely due to the commodity rally, which boosted mm -hmm. South African exports. So that was largely due to what was happening outside of South Africa that has led to a positive outcome for the government. Uh, it is unclear whether that commodity rally will continue for this uh, for the foreseeable future, but it is definitely it appears to be a short term rather than a long term boost in government revenues, and therefore something from a policy perspective needs to be done to raise government revenues and decrease a government expenditure. And if that's not done, unfortunately, Alex, this will negatively impact the ordinary South African, be it the mm. form of paying higher taxes or be it the form of allocation of uh, revenue items. Uh, for example, I earlier touched on that South Africa is increasing its debt levels. That's going to make it more expensive to service that debt, 
meaning that there'll be less uh, money to spend on, on education, there'll be less money to spend on defense and policing, there'll be less money to spend on healthcare, uh, for example, which are very important items. Mm. Well, I mean, I mean, if they had to cut, cut the, 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 you know, the security uh, sort of cluster funding, and I know that's one of the major problems is that they've been cutting, been cutting funding to the police, funding. which keep us safe, which is uh, uh, blows my mind. Although at least, you know, the Defense Force has been parading to Osama by Zex Bantwini. So I guess that money is going somewhere. But um, Sholin, we speak about some of the, the policy changes that could happen and social security. And I see education's yeah. kind of lumped in with that as a broad term. Um, education, social services, we know there are millions. I think, Becky, correct me if I'm wrong, 18 or so million South Africans on some form of a social grant. It is now above 25 million, and that was largely due to the introduction of the COVID-19 social disgrace grant that added millions to, uh, of people receiving the social grant. Uh, the policy objective of the ANC is to sort of make that more per permanent or to introduce mm. a universal basic income grant, which may be a drain on the fiscus. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's about 25 million or so people receiving social grants now. But the, the issue here, Alex, is that we're not growing the economy to make uh, 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 social grants uh, become sustainable. Uh, we're not employing enough people in the labor market. The South African economy is not growing, leading to the fiscus to be strained. No, for sure. But I mean, Sholin, we, 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 we speak about linking it back to policy. Um, and obviously, it's, it's sometimes it becomes a little bit intangible to people on the street who are out there trying to hustle, just trying to buy in order just to put food on the table. Um, you know, what kind of policy, policy, aside from, you know, maybe doing away with some, some state owned enterprises, privatizing here and there, some simple uh, policy proposals, what do you think are some things that we could do instantly from a policy perspective, say with education, as an example, to you know, give people back the dignity that, that they, they're they looking for. Yeah, I'd just like to touch on some of the things that Becky said, uh, specifically mm. with regards to um, the bailouts for state-owned enterprises like ESCOM and SAA and all of these failing government um, entities. I'm like, we, we, have, we have to reallocate those funds that go out for bailouts to things like education where um, it's actually needed more. Cutting funding to to the police where our crime rates are shocking and um it's it's really dangerous out in these streets man i'm like why would we for um be cutting the police um yeah. budget um and something that i definitely do think is a good example for the where this money can be challenged is yeah. something the um institute of race relations um has suggested which is essentially um education vouchers um where school vouchers where Parents are actually given vouchers to actually um, have the ability for them to choose the school where they want to send the kids to and that they do not have to be stuck at failing public schools. Um, and that's a really good policy that I think the government should instead be investing in. Um, another dangerous thing, Alex, that you touched on was um, the social grants. And I'm absolutely shocked by the fact that um, 25 million South Africans are actually dependent on some form of um, social grant. I mean, we should not be given handouts. We should actually be given hand ups. Um, and that's something that um, has developed in South Africa, which is this dependency on the state. Um, and that's a very dangerous culture because we need to be have, have people who are employed, who are skilled, who are educated and are functioning um, as individuals in the free market and are not just dependent on whatever the state gives them, whether it's a 350 rand now or a 200 rand later. Um, no, we need to get people who have solid incomes um, and can actually contribute a fair amount of tax um, to the state to actually improve circumstances around here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, Becky, if you were in Gorongwana's position, um, and you could make one change or propose one policy to to improve South Africa's lot, as it were. What what yeah. what would that be? Uh, the first thing that I that I would firstly highlight is uh, the 
The problem with the ANC is that it, it carries internal contradictions. On one side, they would like to uh, talk up the talk of economic growth, while on the other, carrying policies that are detrimental to the South African economy. If I was in Okwarangwana, I would highlight the costs, for example, of the national health insurance, the costs of expropriation of our compensation, the costs of state-owned enterprises that needs to be constantly bailed out. And we can actually see what are the consequences of that when you're looking at economic performance, even when you look at what Trollin touched on, the budget cuts when it comes to more important items, such as that of policing, which a prime example of, if you need an example, is to look at the July riots of last year, where the police were absolutely unable to maintain law and order, the increase in certain murder uh, or crime uh, statistics that we saw this week and so forth. So if I was thinking of going to highlight the consequences of po those policies, just to talk up of the opportunity costs where the country is going at. You know, the, the, the things, unfortunately, that are ignored by policymakers are the opportunity costs of hostile policies, which unfortunately mm -hmm. the country is currently now paying for with, for example, high debt levels, which unfortunately would lead the average South African to pay more in terms of tax revenue, a declining infrastructure because we cannot allocate infrastructure as well as the fact that there are BE regulations in that aspect that are leading to, uh, 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 for example, a decline in infrastructure, roads, decline in roads, a decline in our railway system and so forth. So if I was in Okwana, I would highlight the negative of those policies and state that the country needs to grow and, and, and try to talk up uh, uh, the policy directions that this country needs in order to emulate what we see in other emerging markets. Mm, no, for sure. I guess, Sholin, what you see here is, is really just a full circle of the, the impact the, of bad yeah. policy. You know, you reduce yeah. spending on, on policing. Uh, you don't deal with uh, nepotism and cronyism within the, the, the state uh, function. Um, yeah. You know, and I think I saw a headline earlier this week that I think in the past two or three months, there's been over 60 cash in transit heists. Now, I'm not entirely sure that that can operate without some sort of inside collaboration. Um, yeah. We know. And, and then on the other hand, we see that with something like the riots, that Ron Posa comes out and says, we are, we are sorry. Um, but then we don't see any accountability from the top down. Mm -hmm. Um so, Sholin, I mean, what what should uh, only people who understand these things very well, like Becky, will go and watch and analyze this speech and, and, and put out some, some content for us to understand it. But for ordinary South Africans, what what should they why should they care about this? I know we've touched on some things, but how how why should they you know it's 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 kind of like your 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 parents kind of dealing with their own budgets and allocating you some maybe some pocket money if they have some um but why why should why should people care about this um yeah i know that sometimes you know these things tend to sound big and enormous and the terms that are used um are usually like scary just because it's such big words um, i'm sure they could know but the truth is that these economic terms and speeches by um you know gonna go on our finance minister these things do have bread and butter um effects for ordinary south africans and the daily lives um that we um experience because whether it's mm. things like buying a milk or bread those things will increase we will see mm. if, like myself i use tra public transport when you use public transport, you will see that the yes. prices for a bus ticket, a taxi ticket, mm -hmm. this is getting to work, getting to school. Mm -hmm. These things will increase. And even except for all of that, we might even see the possibility of our income tax increasing. That's an even greater strain on the pockets of ordinary citizens. And I mean, things are currently tight uh, already in our South African economy. Like, <laughs> you know, there isn't really much luxury because every cent, whether it's our savings or whatever the case may be, those things are under real pressure because um, many of the people at the top, like our finance ministers, are unwilling to make the proper yet difficult decisions regarding our economy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess it comes back full circle back to ideology. Uh, you know, when you've yeah. got a government that sort of senses its, its ideas around the idea of, 
of socialism. And I th- I th- in, before anyone accuses us of being heartless and not wanting people to receive a social grant because you know people don't deserve handouts or whatever, we, we're not we're not espousing that at all. Because Becky, I mean, what yeah. we essentially promoting here is the ability for people to get ahead themselves, to uplift exactly. themselves from whatever position. Exactly. And you know, these kind of things have a have a great effect on people's ability to do that. And I, the one thing I just wanted to pick your brain on. Uh, Becky is is the idea of inflation. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Sholin's spoken about how things get more expensive, and and everyone seems to be talking about inflation this year. Um, mm-hmm. Is that something that Gorongwan has surely got to take into account um, and put some backstop measures in to try and take the pressure off? Because I heard from a, a friend who who used to work uh, in in the oil industry, and he said that you know we could be looking at you know over thirty rand a liter for petrol at the end of the year. Mm, mm, mm. That is unfortunate. Uh, yeah, in fact, on that fuel uh, uh, point that you've raised there, I think if, if you look at the fuel price from December of 2021 compared to December of 2022, there's been an increase of about 40% in the fuel price. So that's massively going to impact people that use public transportation as well as people that uh, go to work, for example. That's a negative impact on them. And that's been one of the main drivers of uh, inflation in the country. Now, is that something that Enoch is going to touch on? I do not particularly think so. These matters are usually touched on by the South African Reserve Bank. I do believe it is something that Enoch should definitely consider and consider the consequences of inflation on in, on the average South African. Unfortunately, inflation tends to be a good thing for the government as it erodes their debt levels. But the person that usually pays for uh, inflation is the average South African by, through the purchasing of bread, through the purchasing of groceries and so forth. So it is definitely something that should needs to be looked at because like, as you've mentioned, this has been a hot topic for over the past uh, few weeks and months and so forth. Uh, I think these matters will be tried to be addressed by the South African Reserve Bank through increasing interest rates, which also unfortunately does uh, um, uh, uh, lead the budgets of some South Africans to be slightly squeezed that have taken on credit over the past year or two, or that have cre- uh, credit and so forth. Mm, for sure. Um, Jens, I think that is just about all the time we have for today before we, we roll out with a an explainer video, uh, which we haven't done in a while. But Becky, before I let you go, where can people get a hold of you? I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love to see your work because you just ex- you yeah. explain these terms so simple <laughs> uh the best place for people to reach out or to see my work is to simply visit the cra website cra essay uh, uh and then just go to my profile and you see my writings i'm not active on any social media accounts uh even on twitter i just usually retweet i, I don't find any use case for it nowadays <laughs> uh but uh yeah just um yeah, just go to the CRA website, go to my profile, look at the CRA's uh, YouTube channel as well. I'm also active there, for example. Uh, yeah, that's where you'll find me. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll obviously include those in, in the description below this video. But uh, yeah, Becky, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we look forward to seeing what your analysis brings for the budget speech. Uh, next up, we have Burning Questions with Mbali and Director of Fan Herman Pretorius. Uh, so we're going to roll out of here with and explain a video and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's the economy, stupid. This was the winning phrase that resonated with voters and helped Bill Clinton win the 1992 US presidential election campaign. This phrase was crafted by Clinton's no-nonsense strategist, James Carville. Carvel understood that, above all, people prized their quality of life, being able to live a comfortable life of their choosing, and that this was intricately connected to the economy. At its core, the economy is a system of transactions, people buying and selling things. The easier it is to buy and sell things, the healthier the economy, and the better the quality of life. Carvel understood that if Clinton could convince voters that his economic policy would ensure a healthy economy and improve their quality of life, he would win the election. And he was right. 
Economic policy determines how easy or difficult it is for people to buy and sell things. But like an ecosystem, the economy is complex. Just as it is neither practical nor sensible for even the smartest ecologists to try and manage weather and rainfall, or the habits of predators, migrating birds and grazing herds, so it is neither practical nor sensible for politicians and bureaucrats to try to manage who buys and sells what, to whom, how, when and where. But just as ecologists can be effective in identifying problems and solutions in an ecosystem, so too can policy ensure the health of the economy. Economic policy determines how easy or difficult it is for you to afford to live a comfortable life of your choosing. Like it or not, we are directly affected by economic policy. You have the power and right to demand good economic policy and get others to do the same. Your freedom is worth fighting for. Join FAN today to build a new tomorrow. Hello and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Burning Questions. Um, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me, hear you, hear me? <laughs> guys, today I'm joined by Mr. HP, the director of FAN. I'm joined by Alex um, and I'm joined by Shola. Guys, welcome to Burning Questions. Hello, fam. It's great to be here. Cool. So, guys, today on Burning Questions, we're at you know, tackling a very interesting um, personality. We are going to be watching a, a short clip of um, Julius Malema, and that's where our conversation is going to be led from. So, yeah, let me roll the clip. And guys, do take notes now, because you're going to have to note some of the parts in the video so that you, you know, there we go. See, people like Alex. You know? <laughs> Roots will not have that appreciation because the black people roots know the first black person he saw is a domestic worker in his house when he grew up. The second black person he saw was a security guard at the gate when he got out. The third black person he saw was a cashier at the shop owned by white people. The fourth black person he saw was the cleaners where he went to school. Those are the blacks he has had an interaction with and he thinks of us like that because that is his exposure to black people. And, 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 and therefore, always characterizing us as non-thinkers, uh, as, 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 as baboons, as people who can't think. And that's why if they hear a leader says, kill the boer, they can go into the house and take machete and go and kill people. Because these are non-thinkers. That's how they view us, that's how they characterize us. It's unfortunate that we find ourselves in a society where we coexist with such people who look at us and who think of us like that. We don't think like that about them. Our leaders never thought of like that about them. Despite the fact that they engaged in genocide of black people when they came here, despite conquering us in the wars of disposition, despite killing kids, in 1976 and in the 80s. We don't think of them like that. We never thought of them like that, but they think like that about us. That's very bad. I was saying in my muted state, that is very bad. This is, you know, that's uh, the end of Julius' statement. Guys, this is a very... Uh, I'm going to say a tricky one, but um, let's start with you, HP. What are your thoughts on, on, on this video? 
Yeah, so um, it it is a tough one. It really, really is a tough one. And perhaps some yeah. context would be would be good to you know what's going on here. Uh, so this yes, is Julius yes, Malema yes. testifying in a court case yeah. um, that was brought by um, Afriform. Uh, against him and the EFF regarding their singing of the song uh, Kill the Boer. Um, and we all might remember, or some of us might remember, that back, way back in 2010, uh, there was a very similar court case to this where uh, Julius Malema was still the president of the ANC Youth League and um, the Af Afri Forum took action to, to have uh, Kill the Boer uh, declared hate speech um, and forbid uh, people from singing it, and and the, the the case was settled, and the ANC undertook that it or, or its organisations won't sing "Kill the Boer" anymore. Uh, the problem is, in the intervening twelve years, uh, a few things have happened. Number one is Mr. Malema left the EFF, and thereby is no longer really a party to um, to to agreements between the ANC and Afri Forum uh, coming from that court settlement. So. The, he he isn't quite uh, um, as uh, accountable as as the original case twelve years ago might have might have held. Um, and secondly, of course, um, there were some changes in the law. Um, since two thousand and ten, uh, we got the Papuda um, Act, which is the um, basically aimed at the the pro uh, promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination act. That's what the Paputa stands for. So if I say Paputa, I'm 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 not you know I'm not sneezing or something. It's the name of legislation, but um, it it changed the test for when something is hate spe hate speech. And then recently, um, the Constitutional Court uh, um, and and some other courts uh, uh, looked at the hate speech re uh, determinations in Paputa and found that these were actually unconstitutional. Uh, so they were changed. So this court case comes from the singing of Kill the Boer that Afri Forum feel uh, meets the criteria of hate speech. And this was Mr. Malema testifying uh, from the stand on, uh, you know, a, a, a quite a few hours, but this clip very, very, very powerfully identified and definitely something to talk about. Yeah, um, yeah definitely, um, fam. Thank you so much for that, um, the backstory. Um, maybe let's go to you, Sholin. Um, as you yeah. heard the background of where this clip comes from, what are your thoughts on it? Um, what the whole spill that Malema has gotten into? Very um, interesting man. Very interesting <laughs> character. Yeah. Um, as usual, you know, Malema is um, quite the controversial figure, as you said. And in the in this video specifically, I find it rather ironic that Malema of all people is the one criticizing someone for thinking that all black people are only lower class workers who are um, domestic workers, security guards, because the if, if are the ones who think that the best way to actually represent all black people is by wearing red overalls. And we know that this is not the case, because I mean that there are some brilliant um, um, black individuals who, you know, believe in ideas such as um, free markets, um, and limited government who have been successful. Mm. And some of them are like Pumlani Majosi, um, Thomas yeah. Sowell, Big Daddy Liberty, Malachi Mbeki. Um, not all um, black people can actually be represented by Malema as you would like Definitely. us to believe. And I would also be very, very, I would be very skeptical if someone like Malema, you know, tries to paint um, black people as victims just because of the color of their skin. Um, because, you know, um, that's not usually the case and that all, not all black um, people are actually working class Marxists as Malema yeah. would like us to believe. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mr. Alex, your thoughts before I go into uh, something else? Mm. Yeah, I think the, the idea of victimhood is a very good one that Sholin touches on. Um, mm. But for me, I mean, obviously one knows there's a sort of certain stereotype that Malema is playing into here that that mm -hmm. people are familiar with right and mm -hmm. i think he's very what's quite scary about him is very convincing you know you could watch this and be like yeah man Bro, i need to go and I was like, wash yes, my car sir. with my white tears you know what i mean hey. um 
But um, check your no, one the, privilege, Alex. Exactly, exactly. When I look, oh. actually, when I drive after I've washed my car, I check in my mirror to see if I, if I've still got my white privilege following me. Um, but no, I, I think it's I think it's a case of what I find so interesting about um, Lemme is is the playing up of victimhood in his okay. sort of nationalist rhetoric um, in order to be divisive. Um, there's yeah. nothing unifying yeah. about it. I don't think he intends to be unifying. Um, and I don't know how many people uh, watching it can get behind that sort of message. Um, obviously, there's some people that may resonate with and, and that's that's the danger is that, um, you know, when you when you it, when things aren't going well around you and you, you're living in economic circumstances that are below the breadline, you might see this and be like, yeah, down with definitely. white people, whatever yeah. it is, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. Because yeah. I think I mentioned this off air. I was like, when I was watching some of those clips, I was like, yes, preach, black brother. I definitely agree with you. But I was like, um, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. And um, I think with what um, Sholen and Alex are both mentioning is that he's pushing this idea of black people should always be victims. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say, listen, Definitely, let's not let's not downplay um, apartheid. Let's not downplay what happened. Yeah. Let's not downplay um, obviously the trauma, which there still is some trauma. I think with maybe the older generation, but I, mm. I'm gonna say as a young black twenty two year old, I don't really carry that trauma around with me. It's probably just adopted. Mm. I use it sometimes when I feel like it. Jokes, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But um, I think um, with, the, with, with the content that those kind of things that Julius Malema is saying, especially for us, maybe young people, people who consume this kind of content, we now start building all these ideas, things that we don't even resonate with and we start making it our own, which is very dangerous. And, and as Alex was saying that someone might literally just watch this and say, yes, definitely, I agree with you. Um, mm. Pansy with white people, do you understand? Which is a very mm. dangerous thing in a democracy. Um, Mr. HP, do you have anything else to add? You're very, you're very quiet today. I don't, I don't I like this. Like 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think um, you touched on something there. This, this, this sort of appropriation of of suffering um, is is something actually quite complex. Because let's break down what what Mr. Malema is actually saying there. He talks very definitely about they do this, this, and this, we, us. So there's this this, this grouping. Um, then he goes on about they killed young black South Africans in 1976 um, and in the 1980s. The problem is I wasn't around in 1976 or the 1980s. And I, I, not even the, the, the white person he's, he's talking about, Adam Strutz, uh, was uh, so, so there's this problem of creating these tribes, not not actually treating people as individuals, people who can think for themselves, but actually yeah. saying that white people, you collectively are responsible for white actions, and black people, you collectively, no matter whether it's 50 years ago, 150 years ago, or today, things done to black people were done to all black people. And things done by white people were done by all white people. And then he accuses Mr. Roots of dehumanizing. But maybe, Sam, quick one. Um, I can hear myself, by the way, from your side. Let me just mute you a bit. Okay. Um, maybe a person might then come through to you and say, but from all those actions, from all those things that happened in apartheid, um, white privilege, you still have that white privilege. Black people, from everything that happened in apartheid, you still, you know, you still kind of discriminated against. We still see kind of these things. They might come to you and say, but this is South Africa. We see these things every day. What do you then say to that person? Well, I think I would say to that person that I wouldn't repeat the policies that got, got us into this situation in the first place. If you want to listen to someone who sounds like Julius Malema, go listen to Hendrik Verwurt. There are some interviews with him on YouTube. The way he talks about them and us, very, very similar to Malema. So what Hendrik Verwurt wanted to do was he wanted the state to control the economy to the advantage of his preferred race group. What do you think Julius Malema wants to do? He wants the state to control the economy to the advantage of his preferred race group. And of That's course right. we have to agree that, you know, uh, uh, black people were treated horribly by apartheid. I mean, one of my notes here is, 
is truth. One of the notes I made here was it's probably true. As you know, as a white South African, I did grow up, and the first black person I met was the domestic worker. But what mm -hmm. Mr. Malema sort of misses is that we have to look at why there was economic exclusion in the first place. And we can give two answers, race-based policies and state control of people's economic decisions. That's mm -hmm. why these black people he mentions, the security guards, the cleaners, the domestic workers, that's why these people were kept and made poor in the first place. And he wants that turbocharged as a policy. In his testimony, he made the absurd claim that he wants the state to take control of all land so that the people can have it. When last has the state taken something, something and then treated it as the property of the people? And perhaps the last thing I want to make clear about Mr. Malema is he is incredibly good at this sort of advocacy. Um, and the other day, I, I actually was haunted by, by my first memory um, of, of understanding the difference between black people and white people and how they are treated. I was, I must have been about five or six okay. um, and I was at home and there was a guy painting our house, a black guy painting our house. Mm -hmm. um, and then he sort of caught my attention through the front door and he asked, can he go to the bathroom? And I was like five, six years old. I was like, yes, of course. And he said, yeah, but can I show him where it is? And I said to him, okay, come along. And I invited him into our house and I was about to show him the bathroom that I use and he said yeah. no 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 the outside bathroom the mm. dirty bathroom that haunts me that yeah. haunts me uh that and 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 I, I couldn't quite for many many years almost 25 years now that mm. memory tested somewhere in the back of my mind and I've never actually thought of it again since literally a week ago uh, yeah. when it's been constantly in my mind, to say that people were treated awfully. They were dehumanized. But why yeah. were they dehumanized? Because they were treated as a group. Black people equal dirty, equal deserving yeah. dirty bathroom, outside bathroom. White yeah. people equal good. That idea of treating people as a group, rather than me treating you, Mbali, as you, Mbali, you, Sherlin, as you, Sherlin, you, Alex, as you, Alex, rather than me treating you guys as individuals, people I can love, I can annoy, I can hate, I can disagree with, I can agree with, I can fight with, I can love. Rather than doing that, Mr. Malema puts his foot in exactly the same hole that got us into this in the first place. And that is the Fervurdian idea of going them and us and yeah. them and us. You don't solve the problems of the past by going back to the thinking that caused the problems in the first place. Yeah, no, that is definitely true. That is definitely true. I don't know if you guys have anything to add before we close um, the show. I feel, you know, it's a bit saddish. You know, it's a bit saddish, but you know, it's okay. Yeah, I, I must agree. <laughs> I must agree with what Arman says about the fact that Malema and the likes of Verwurt, the likes of Hitler, they are, um, two different sides of the exact same coin. Um, yep. Because yep. the ones were just on the right and now Malema's on the left side of um, the political spectrum. And yeah, that's exactly a dangerous territory of um, actually repeating the mistakes that took place in the past um, yeah. through the type of yeah. thinking that Malema um, yeah, promotes. Sorry, can I, I, I can need I, to... I need to jump in quickly there and just make a point that, fam, you're saying this is a very sad and downbeat episode. Yes, but it doesn't have to be because let's look at the facts. Let's look at the reality. Hendrik Verwoerd, long gone, long gone, apartheid, long gone. These things end. These things come to an end when enough people say, you know what? This nonsense, I'm sorry, no, I'm not going to buy into this nonsense anymore. Yeah. Two thirds of white South Africans in 1992 in the referendum said, Mr. Verwood, take your apartheid and drink it where the sun don't shine. And by that, I don't mean Scotland. But the point is, these things end. These things yeah. come to a close when enough people get involved and enough people go, this is rubbish. This is... Definition. 
<laughs> so I just muted my mic strategically there. Um, and if we look at the data, South Africans are doing that and they yeah. want to do that. And we yeah. can take it to our hearts and we can sleep easy at night that we are not a country of racist. We are not a country of verwurts and malems. Mm. These mm. people are out there and they are weaponizing hurt, real hurt. Yeah. They are weaponizing it just like the apartheid government did. But we need to step up. We yeah. need to step up. And every time we hear this, go out and speak to someone from a different background than yours and yes, love them and get to know them and understand that you want good schools for your kids, they want good schools for their kids. You want a safe community, they want a safe community. If you, haven't, yeah. if you don't know your neighbor, take the end of this podcast, listen to it, that lack of fan, you know, freedom is worth fighting for, put down the device you're busy with and go uh, ring the bell of your neighbor and say, I know, but I'm, I'm a fellow South African. This might be weird, but I don't think I know you well enough. And if that person is someone you know or someone who shares your background culturally, linguistically, mm. then go to the next house and the next house and the next house until you find the South African who's so different from you that mm. someone like Malena or someone like Fervurt would want to put you in a fight against each other. Speak to that person. Get to know them. Ask them where their kids go to school. Do the basic human thing of treating someone else as a human being. And you will see that Mr. Malema and Mr. Fervurt can only get mm. power when we don't know each other and we don't love each other and we don't talk to each other as individuals who share the same color blood. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think to end the show, it's just safe to say, guys, um, don't be fooled by Malema's great wording. Like, I'll give that to him. He's great at speaking. But you know what? Don't be fooled. And as HP had said, has said, go out, learn who your neighbor is, go meet new people, uh, people that you relate with. And do remember, your freedom is definitely worth fighting for.